Episode 43 on this very last week of October 2020 is with my pal Derek Wilson of the Primal King Podcast. Check it out. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. Western Huntsman Podcast. Guys, welcome to episode number 43. This is Jim Huntsman, the host, coming at you from the Broken Time studio in Hayden, Idaho, where we are experiencing uh, quite the snow pandemic. You want to talk about pandemics. We had a pandemic of snow, and it really derailed an elk hunt I was trying to go on this last weekend. Uh, the roads were like icicles getting up to this spot that uh, I, I had a lot of, uh, you know, I, I had high hopes for. And man, I, I couldn't hardly get up there. I had to just crawl over these passes because like one wrong move and I'm going off the mountain, uh, right over this dirt road. So anyways, guys, just, uh, like, it's kind of like a warning just, or a word of caution. If you guys are traversing those, you know, that. That's for, for, for new hunters, for, for guys that may, may not have a lot of experience driving dirt roads in the fall when there's new snow and fall snow in particular, because what happens is that snow is going to, it's going to heat up during the day a little bit and create a lot of, you know, mushy type kind of, uh, melty snow on the top of the road. And then overnight it's going to freeze solid as a rock and it becomes slicker than snot. And you just got to be super careful going up the next morning. So don't end up in the ditch or off the, off a cliff or off the side of the mountain or it's a rope pain in the butt. I did that once and I had, it was like this guy, he reminded me of crocodile Dundee and a tow truck showed up to, to pull my truck back up, up onto the road. So, uh, interesting experience. So just throwing that out there. Guys, welcome to the episode. I got a great conversation today. Lined up with a buddy of mine. His name is Derek Wilson, and he's got this great platform called Primal King. And it's a podcast and a website, and it's all about mindset training. And, and, uh, you know, he talks about the three pillars. We're going to get into all this during the episode. Um, and it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great asset for, for you guys to have if, if you're into that kind of thing. And I know I am. Uh, I, I like having, uh, listening to these conversations where he brings on these guests that talk about how to become successful and why they became successful and the kind of mindset and and motivation and all these things that uh, you know I, I I'm a, I'm a, I geek out on that kind of stuff I, I really like it I really enjoy his podcast uh, and he is a he's a fellow Idahoan he's down in the Riggins area and he also has a ranch with a new venture called Crosso Meats where it's kind of like a direct uh, filled to uh, or, or they say mountain to table uh, beef ranch, cattle ranch, and you can basically buy beef direct and, and they'll, they'll either ship it to you or deliver it, or you can go pick it up or, or whatever. Anyway, you're going to, you're going to learn a lot more about that. And we talk about hunting. We talk about how we even talk about politics, man. That's a first on the, on the podcast, but, uh, we, we do kind of get into it a little bit and, and, uh, that's, that's okay with me. So hope you guys enjoy this episode with Derek. He's a great guy. Um, just a, just a motivating dude, super cool to have on the, on the show and uh, I appreciate him joining us. So before we get into that, um, I do. There, there's a couple things I want to cover real quick. First of all, um, I want to talk like a like a gear highlight every once in a while, and I want to I want to mention my Scree hard scrabble pants, not in in like an advertisement form, because you guys know Scree is a show sponsor, and uh, I'm super proud to have them on board and everything. But uh, I, I just want to I want to kind of brag on these pants, these hard scrabble pants. They're kind of an early season hunting pant. Yeah, put a ton of miles on these things, and I wore them in all weather. It, it, you guys know, hunting the West, you can experience all four seasons in September, <laughs> and that's what I did, man. I had hail, I had uh, extreme heat, uh, you know, all, all, everything, and I've already talked about that on, on other podcasts, but these pads, they, they just did really good. Uh, I finally got blood on them. The blood came right out. 
They're uh, they're breathable. They keep you cool. They keep you dry. I like literally. I, I forgot my gaiters one day. Uh, going out on a, on a pretty wet morning really wasn't an issue in these pants. So I just wanted to point that out. Like these are the type of this is the kind of pair of pants that you want to have. Um, and they've performed. They've outperformed other more expensive. Uh, hunting pants that I've had in the past, so that's a that's a huge point. They're not going to break the bank. Um, just a just a solid pair of pants, man. I'm j- I'm just pointing that out. If you guys are in the market, you should check them out. They're the hard scrabble pants uh, on Screegear.com, and don't forget to use a promo code if you do get those. So because they like I said, they are a show sponsor. Um, and with that, guys, I want to move into the trivia question from last week. Uh, we had a huge response. I was really excited, and there were some of these answers were like long winded too. Um, which was way cool because uh, yeah, you guys know me. I like I like to read about this stuff. So uh, I learned some things just from some of your answers. So I appreciate everybody that wrote in, and not one person wrote in with a wrong pan- uh, answer. Everybody was uh, was right on the money. Uh, they nailed it, and I took all those names and I put them on a spreadsheet. And we're gonna keep rolling with this trivia stuff uh, as we go on. And so, uh, the, the question was just so everybody knows the question was, what is the one ungulate, uh, that happens to be in North America that doesn't quite have antlers, but doesn't quite have horns. It's like a combination of them. And they shed those horns every year, which is very rare for any kind of horned animal. Uh, most horn or uh, all horned animals with the exception of this one do not shed those horns. But this one does, and the answer is it is the pronghorn. That's right. If you've ever been hunting that speed goat out uh, out here in the West, man, you've seen you've seen these things. They can move. They're extremely adaptable. Uh, they're they're an amazing animal, and uh, they are the one and only ungulate that actually has you can you can define the antler slash horn as a horn, and they actually shed those on an annual basis. So pretty cool. Um, th- so we're going to have another trivia question, uh, should be on the next episode coming up. But, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all those names when you guys answer those and th- you guys are going to, I'm putting everybody on a, on a spreadsheet and, and you can enter more than once. So you're not just like one time you answer, uh, it doesn't mean you can't answer the next question. And so, if you answer every other week or whenever we do this, this trivia, uh, you, you could be in there multiple times. You can't, you know, enter for the same question twice, like, you know, but, uh, give me three different answers that it was a pronghorn. Uh, but if you guys answer it each, each with each trivia question, you'll have multiple entries and we're going to have some prizes. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking at kind of doing the first round of prizes around Thanksgiving or so. So just stay posted to that and stay tuned to that. It's going to be fun. I had a lot of fun doing that and, uh, I really enjoyed your guys' answers. So thanks a, thanks a ton. That was cool. All right. Lastly, before we get into the episode with with Derek, I, I want to talk to my my people down there in Colorado. If you're in Colorado and you're listening to this, I know because this is the last episode, by the way, before Election Day. Election Day, in fact, is one week from today, the day that I'm recording this. So I'm obviously I'm recording this on Tuesday. So next week is election day, and I know everybody wants to talk, oh, Trump or oh, Biden and, and blah, 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 and, and and you can't get on social media without getting inundated with uh, political memes and 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 all this presidential stuff and the, and the new Supreme Court and uh, nominee, actually she was confirmed, and uh, all, the, all, that, all that jazz happening out there. Uh, if you're like me, you're probably – pretty ready for uh, the the election to be done with because I want to get back to seeing more stuff about hunting and fishing and outdoors and uh, yeah you know just the stuff that's that's a little bit more entertaining and interesting to to, to follow on social media because right now everybody's just kind of there everybody you know they, they, that's what they want to talk about however there is a down ballot issue that uh, you Coloradoans have and it's it's a very important one if you've been listening to this show for any length of time, you know where we stand on the reintroduction of wolves. That initiative is on the ballot in Colorado this year. I hope you listened to the episode with Dr. Valerius Geist. I hope you've listened to the intro with uh, my episode with Marty Mariotto uh, from Mountain Men because I had Justin Webb on there, and we discussed uh, the challenges that we as Idahoans face with wolves. 
Uh, and I say Idaho because that's obviously that's where I'm at. I my friends in Montana deal with the same thing. My friends in Wyoming they deal with the same thing. And what what I'm trying to get at is whatever I can do to maybe help my friends in Colorado not have to deal with this. And Utah, frankly, because the way that Colorado and Utah, the way that their borders align, uh, Utah, this is on the ballot for you too in Colorado. So if you know people in Colorado that may not be informed or up to speed on on this this wolf issue and this reintroduction discussion, you should probably call them because it's going to affect you too. And you should talk to them about it and and talk about what we've experienced in these these upper states, these northern states with these wolves already being reintroduced here. It's a disaster. It's bad for the ecosystem. It's bad for the landscape. It's bad for public land. It's bad for elk, deer, moose. Um, I, I, I was going to say speed goats, but now uh, the, the, the pronghorn's going to outrun a wolf. I don't, I don't know of any pronghorn getting taken out by wolves, but I could be wrong on that. But anyway, the point is, the majority of our ungulate populations have suffered greatly because of the wolf reintroduction and the very difficulty or the, the difficulty of managing them when you have this pro wolf movement blocking our management capabilities. And that's what's going to happen in, in Colorado. If, if that initiative gets passed, they're going to reintroduce, reintroduce the wolf. And then you're going to be in years of litigation. And these pro wolf organizations and animal rights organizations are going to be up in your shit and they're going to be putting this 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 ballot box game management system into place into Colorado. And right now, Colorado, you guys have the strongest elk numbers in the American West. In fact, in, in the entire country. You guys have the, the best elk herds, the most. Uh, you, you have a great landscape. You have the, the great habitat for these elk. That will change. Mark my words. That will change. If they reintroduce wolves into Colorado, and I know there is already a pack that is that has been discovered, or, or so to speak, or noticed, or whatever you want to call it, up in the northwest corner. I'm I'm a we- I'm well aware of that pack. Leave it at that pack, because if they reintroduce wolves, what what is going to be the domino effect? What's the domino effect of this? I'll tell I'll, I'll tell you exactly what it is. Millions and millions of dollars in litigation that a lot of taxpayers are going to be paying for. Once those wolves are opened up to management to allow for hunting and trapping, you're going to suddenly have residents of Colorado that don't have a clue how to hunt and trap these wolves. They're unlike any other animal that we pursue. What we had to do in Idaho was bring in trappers from Alaska that had experience with wolves to teach trappers how to do uh, how to trap them here. This takes years to get the skill and, and the people and the know-how and the, and the willingness of folks to do it. We have a wonderful organization here called Foundation for Wildlife Management that has streamlined that process. And without them, I have no idea where we'd be. But the, getting back to the domino effect, nobody's going to know how to trap these wolves. They're, they are prolific breeders. They will outbreed the ungulate populations, your wolf, your, I'm sorry, your elk numbers will be severely impacted negatively. They'll, they will be in decline. You will still have the same amount of hunters on the landscape, which Colorado is a massive amount of hunters. I mean, you guys are, you know, over the counter, uh, general, general units and all this stuff that, you, you know, pretty much anybody can go to Colorado, buy a tag and go elk hunting. So you guys, you guys already get inundated. Uh, not to mention geographically, you're just kind of right there. So a lot of folks from, you know, back east in the Midwest and stuff, they can they can just hop on the freeway and they're there. And so you get inundated by by non-residents and residents alike. So you, you, you have a declining elk population and you have all these hunters still trying to get an elk. Um, what's going to happen? You, you're going to lose your elk. I mean, it, that's that's what's happening to us in Idaho. And it, that that is going to be very difficult to recover from because you also have a black bear uh, in, in the state of Colorado. And so if you listen to the episode with Dr. Geis, we talk about the predator pit and, and how that, how the black bears are going to maintain these low populations. Once, uh, once we have gotten into this position where there, there's like this predator, predator pit situation and, and that the elk numbers are, have severely declined. There's still a lot of hunters. There's not a lot of elk left. The, what is that going to do to our public lands? The value of our public land without the wildlife 
There is no value to the public land. It's it's a vessel for these pro privatization of public lands folks to say, well, what what's the point of having the public land at this point? There's hardly you know no because nobody people will stop hunting. That's already happening in Idaho. There's there's folks that were uh, big time into elk hunting and they flat out stopped elk hunting because they, there's there's units that just you know there's no elk left. The the wolves have wiped them out and it's now in kind of a predator pit scenario. And and so you're going to have a huge reduction in hunters, and uh, without hunting the public land, like that the, the yeah you have to understand good, bad, or indifferent. Hunting is what is a financial um, a revenue producer for the state. I mean we all know that, yeah, you know tag fees and everything else that goes into it. Without that revenue source, there is no point whether federal or state, for these public lands to stay public. And these public lands will, we will lose our public access to public lands. It will become private. I have no doubt about this. We, we've seen the studies and the research and the effects of these wolves and, and what happens. It's, it's really not rocket science. This is just a, a normal, uh, not normal, but it, 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 th- this is the only direction it can go if you cannot get these wolves under control and prevent the pro-wolf organizations who have endless amounts of money that they get from some dude sitting on the couch watching an ad that's irrelevant to his life out of, you know, California or Florida or New York or Chicago, these places where their life is not impacted on on whether or not wolves create a predator pit on their on their landscapes. They don't care. What they care about is that individual wolf that was shown on this ad on TV, this poor wolf that that has been managed, uh, that has been harvested, that has been shot, that has been trapped, however you want to put it, and they donate money to it. You've seen those kind of ads. Everybody's seen those ads. They're very deceptive. They're not based in, in factual evidence or actual science or actual wildlife research. The facts are on our side. And I would encourage you in Colorado to do what you can to make sure that ballot does not get passed. And I, I, I'm like just hoping and praying for you, Colorado, because this is, this is a big deal. We're going to know more in about a week. Um, do what you can. I, I mean, do what you can, guys. If, like I said, if you live in Utah, though, there is nothing stopping those wolves from coming over into Utah. And you guys are not in a position to... Uh, because they are, were not formally uh, reintroduced into Utah, you, you will have no management capability or options because they'll be on the endangered species list. You won't be able to do anything about it. You'll just be able to sit back and watch your, your herds get annihilated by wolves. Same thing with Arizona and New Mexico. Those wolves will absolutely, without a doubt, come into New Mexico and Arizona. They will hybridize with other dogs, coyotes, uh, red wolves, the Mexican gray wolf, um, it's, it's a problem. It just case in point, it's just, it's just a problem. So I hope you guys are all paying attention. The point with what I was trying to get at with the other States there is if you know people in Colorado, you you should call them and and let them know, Hey, are you voting? Uh, no, I don't want to talk about Trump and Biden. I want to talk about the wolf issue, the, the initiative on your ballot in Colorado wolf issues. It's going to impact many Western States. And I'm concerned, and I want you to know about this. Here are the facts. This isn't like a shameless plug for, for the Western Huntsman podcast, but send them the episode with Dr. Geist where he breaks it down and ask them, hey, take, take the two hours. I know it's a long podcast, but take the two hours and listen to this before you make your decision, especially if they're on the fence. Or maybe they're pro-wolf. They don't know. They don't know any better. Send them, send them the, uh, the, the episode with Dr. Geist. Anyways, guys, I hope... I'm hoping and praying. That's that's all I want to say about that is is that you guys in Colorado uh, see success on this ballot initiative and and that, that that wolf reintroduction idea is is done away with because that is not the appropriate way to manage our wildlife is through a ballot box. That is just not the appropriate way to do it. We, you know it and I know it. If you're listening to this show, you already know this. You need to make other people aware of that. That is not how research and scientific wildlife management and years of experience leads us. Because there's people that will be voting that are clueless 
They, they've never been in the national forest. They've never been on an elk hunt. They've never been on a deer hunt. They've never seen trappers do their thing. They've never, they've never experienced migration patterns of mule deer. They don't know the concept of, of wildlife and, and our landscapes and, and the, the ecological factors that are at play here. They have no idea. All they see is, do we want wolves? Yes or no? Hell yeah, that'd be cool. I'd love to hear a wolf howl when I go bird watching in the sanctuary. That's what you're up against. So I'm just pleading with you guys. Um, I've I've actually reached out to a, a few folks that I know in Colorado uh, and and made sure that they're you know up to speed on this situation and and you know whatever I can do. If you guys have any other ideas of what I could do uh, prior to prior to election day, just let me know. I'd, I'm more than happy to help. If you're in Colorado and you have an idea, hey, you know what, Jim, you can do this. Uh, you you can help us here there. Just let me know. Let me know. So. Uh, Jim at the Western Huntsman.com. That's my email address. I'm available. I'm here for you guys. Uh, so just uh, just throwing all that out there. Okay, guys, let's get back to the uh, the regular episode here with Derek Wilson. You guys are going to like this episode um, just because it's not the normal episode for, for the Western Huntsman. We we do talk hunting, right? I mean, we, you can't get through an episode on the Western Huntsman podcast without talking hunting. So obviously we talk a lot of hunting. But we also talk about ranching, and we also talk about wolves that impact uh, Derek as a rancher, and we also talk about um, the a, a mindset and and the the whole platform that is the Primal King podcast. I'd encourage you guys to check out the website and check out a few episodes of the Primal King podcast. It's it's he's a cool dude. You, you guys are just gonna like him. I, I know you will. So I sure do, and I'm excited for you to hear this. And so. Without further ado, let's get to it with Derek Wilson. Guys, have a great week. If you're still out there chasing elk, good luck. I know I am. And uh, then I am switching to deer season. And then after that, I'm switching to full-on wolf season. So here we go, guys, with Derek Wilson. Enjoy. All right, guys, this week, this is going to be a cool conversation because I've got Derek Wilson, who is the founder of Primal King and the Primal King podcast and a really cool uh, ranch kind of like farm to table kind of setup that we're going to talk about. Um, I'm, I'm super thrilled to have you on, Derek. Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it, Jim. Excited to be on. Yeah, so uh, we got a lot to talk about, man. <laughs> I think you just hit your year mark on on your podcast, didn't you? Yep, just crossed the the one year mark like a week and a half ago. I think it was. Sweet. Do you want to do you want to kind of give everybody like an introduction of of who you are and and uh, tell us a little bit about your podcast? Sure. So, um, gosh, kind of a crazy story. So, cut me off if I get long winded here. But um, <laughs> basically, I grew up in a really small town, Central Idaho, Riggins, Idaho. And uh, was born and raised here on a ranch. And then after that, kind of wanted to get away from it. And so I ended up somehow or another finding my way into like the internet marketing world, which is obviously like a 180 degree difference from how I grew up and ended <laughs> yeah. up working for a software company that kind of blew up and, and my boss built an awesome business. So I kind of got to see the business side of that. But what I don't know, I'm, I've, I'm always been a, a small town guy at my roots. And so um, about coming up actually on four years in December, my dad passed away from a massive heart attack. And when that happened, he had remarried six months previous to that. And so because he didn't have a will, we ended up having to kind of figure stuff out with my stepmom and not to go down that rabbit hole. Um, I talked about that in the podcast, I guess, if people are really curious about it. But but yeah, we ended up kind of going through this process, uh, having to buy out my stepmom, kind of having this deadline. It was really kind of a crazy time. But when we were kind of faced with losing the ranch, I realized, I guess, what maybe was important to me. And a lot of that kind of came back to lifestyle. And again, I was working the, the awesome job, making all the money, um, you know, kind of living that way, I guess, but really kind of my heart was always back on the ranch and back the small town roots and everything else. So we ended up, um, me, my wife, our four kids selling our dream home that we had purchased two years before that and moved back to the ranch, bought my stepmom out 
and we moved into like our 120 year old ranch house here. So we go from, you know, Jim, like a 3000 square foot plus house with like marble or, or granite <laughs> countertops and all this stuff to literally a house that was falling down. And so we completely remodeled that. How, how did and, the uh, wife, yeah. how did the wife feel about that? So it's so funny because the first time I talked to her, so we're going back and forth, right? On like, what do we do? Do we just, do we just sell the ranch? You know, because we had no control in kind of like the future of the ranch, right? Because my stepmom was the executor. Um, We were 50, 50 partners. Me and my, my older sister um, were kind of half and then she was the other half. So basically she were And not not to cut you off, but you you guys were 50, 50 in the business of the ranch and your stepmom owned the ranch. Is that, is that kind of the land? She was was the executor since my dad didn't have a will. Gotcha. And so basically she would make all the decisions. So even if me and my sister were like, we don't want to sell, um, it wouldn't matter because she could force the sale because she essentially had all the authority that my dad had when he was alive. Gotcha. And how yeah, and so, was, was things like before your dad died, were you, were you cool with your stepmom or was there like some tension oh yeah. prior to that? Or like, how did that look? No, like I've known her for 30 years. In fact, her, her sons, um, like I grew up with, like they were, I mean, I would almost oh, consider them right. brothers before. Yeah. 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 I think, and, I think I remember that from one of your episodes, you were talking about that. Yeah. And so, you know, that does different things to different people. That's one thing, you know, because, uh, you know, after losing my dad, like I realized like death does different things to different people. I think there are some people who kind of fall into sadness and and stuff like that. There's other people who maybe have like resentment or anger about it, right? It's not fair. And everybody processes it differently. So I don't hold anything against her for what happened. I think she dealt with things the best way that she could, Mm -hmm. but she wanted out of the ranch. I, I, I feel like she didn't think that that myself or my sister really cared that much about it because we had, we'd both gone on and kind of built our own lives. And so I think that she didn't think we really cared about it. And so she just wanted to be done with it, wanted to sell it. And, you know, my sister and I, we could have split half of the half, basically. We could have put a bunch of money probably in the bank and just kind of went about our lives, right? But yeah, for yeah. me, I, I I kept thinking like, you know, this is a fifth generation ranch. Like my great, great grandpa, you know, homesteaded this, my great grandpa who I spent a ton of time with as a kid. Cause we live right next door to him. And my parents were both working a lot and stuff. My dad on the ranch, my mom, you know, bartending, waiting table, stuff like that. So I spent a ton of time and it was like, I just don't see this being how the story ends. I don't see this, my dad dying in the ranch getting sold. And maybe we get a couple hundred thousand dollars put in the bank. Like, I don't care about that stuff. Right. And so, sure. So yeah, we, I remember talking to my wife the first time and she was terrified. Like she grew up in a relatively small town in, in Alaska, but nothing like Riggins, Idaho, right? <laughs> like yeah. most people here, t- a small town and it's like at least 10,000 plus, right? I mean, not 400. <laughs> so yeah. there's, so she there's was just not like, much to Riggins, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And so, but the funny thing was, is that once I was like, you know, this is something I want to do. I mean, like seriously, bless her heart. I don't know very many women who would have been like, okay, let's do it then, right? Like, let's, yeah. let's pick up our family. We had t- our twin girls uh, were less than a year old at that point. Oh, man. And we're moving into a house that, that like, literally, it should have been condemned. Um, you know, we, <laughs> so we you've took got, pictures. Yeah. You've got, like, your dream house, and you yeah. sell that bad boy. It's probably got, like, you know, heated floors in the bathroom and stuff. <laughs> it, it actually did. It, I it swear did. to God, it actually did, yes. <laughs> and, and you bring your wife to this little ranch house that's just, like, probably, what, just the floors are messed up, needs paint, probably old carpet, uh, and floors caving in. So when we, trouble. <laughs> when, we, when we made the decision to move back, um, we actually started, started the remodel, and it was supposed to be like basically done by the time we got here. We had a contractor doing it and like the floors were supposed to be redone because we, the, the kitchen was literally like a year, probably 50, 60, 70 years ago. I don't know when oh, wow. um, it, it was, it had no, no foundation. And so like you would walk into the kitchen and you dropped about three inches because <laughs> there was no foundation. And so we're like, we've I love got it. To sh- yeah, we've got to sure up the kitchen. So we hired a contractor, long story short, they got way behind. We spent the first week because we, we had the school deadline, right? To get our kids into school. So yeah. we moved back August 26th, the first week we spent in an Airbnb. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then 
when we moved into the house, the, the cabinet maker died. Like no, jo- I mean, just everything you could Jeez, think of. Man. Yeah. The cabinet maker had died. So, uh, the cabinets were like eight weeks behind schedule. And so we, we literally moved into the house after a week in the Airbnb with about a 400 square foot area that was kind of like the living room bedroom and the rest of it, the floor was torn up. There was no counters. Like we literally lived like the first few months there with two saw horses, a piece of plywood, uh, an electric skillet and a microwave. We'd have to get our water from the bathroom, which to go to the bathroom, you had to put your shoes on because you're going to catch a nail in your foot from the floor. That was, I mean, it was oh, just man. like, I'm, I'm, so I'm like, you know, I was like, I talked my wife into coming here and then we get here and it's like this. And I'm like, she's going to freaking divorce me. You know, <laughs> like, this is, this, you know, we've got two twins that are like, a, you know, they just turned a year old at that point. And we're like, no, like we're fencing them in because they can't get over to certain areas because they're going to get a nail or uh, it was, it was crazy, man. It, that is like crazy. Said, but it sounds like your wife was a, yeah, it sounds like she was a trooper, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. she absolutely was. And the funny thing is now is that she, I feel like, uh, I'm, I'm like, she's home, which is, is weird, right? Because like I said, she's not from here. We met, um, you know, in college and stuff. And so she's not from a small town like this. Like she's from Alaska, you know, kind of rural, but, but like mm-hmm. the town she went to, the high school she went to was still, you know, a couple thousand kids in it, I think. And so, uh, you know, not like, like 40, like is in our high school here right now. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like she was used to this and, and, you know, the nearest Walmart or whatever is like two hours away from us. She's not used to that lifestyle, but man, she settled right in. She's like president of the PTO now. <laughs> like, Oh, nice. And, she absolutely loves it here. So that's that's cool, man, because a lot of times uh, we struggle with our spouse. In ter- a lot of people struggle with their spouse in terms of getting them on, on board if it's like this major lifestyle change because that's not what they signed up for in the beginning. And so I think that that says a lot about her, um, you know, to, to come home to something that's important to you and make this lifestyle and, and make a life and a home um, totally out of her comfort zone. And, and yeah. so... Because I know I, I know about where you're at and like just I just I know the climate. I know you know the the there's not it's not like you could jump in the car and run down to IHOP if you don't feel like cooking <laughs> or something, you know, and, and so that's pretty amazing. Yeah, it, it's been so cool. And and like I said, she's just really and, and I even remember like, you know, the first several years because we've been we've been together now um basically since we were nineteen. So I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, we're kind of closing in on that 20 year mark that we've been together. And I remember her always talking about how she just always loved like these cute little farmhouses that kind of get fixed up and stuff. And it's like, well, honey, here, here we go. <laughs> like, here's your opportunity. Yeah, you like yeah that here cute you go. Farmhouse? <laughs> here's the reality of it. Let's do yeah. this. That first year back though was just such a, a nightmare. And, and I mean, like, I, I'm super grateful that we can look back on it now and kind of laugh about it because you know, it was just everything with the house. Like we used to always kind of make the joke, like my dad's cows were always fat and happy, but like he didn't care about the house much. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, and then my grandparents, my great grandparents before that lived in it. And so, so it was kind of like a pride thing for us. Like, Hey, I don't know if this will be our forever home. Like we want to build another house somewhere on the ranch, but, but like restoring this place was important, I think. And so it's like, Hey, we've done that. So we've kind of checked that thing off. That's, that's fantastic, man. I, I, it's like, I've got, I've got, uh, you know, a farm and ranch in, in my, my family as well. And, and so I know like the, just the sentimental value of it and the importance of passing that on through generations and maintaining these, these lands that, um, you know, that are worked from, from generation to generation. It's not like this is just, you know, recreational property. This is, this is actual land that you guys have worked and put blood, sweat and tears in for, for several generations. So I think it's, I I think that that's important and it's, it's really cool that you guys, you know, put your heads down and bucked up and did this because now, and, and that's another question. So you, you get, you get your wife out to the ranch and you guys fix up the house you're going through all this adversity to get things kind of rolling and, and this major life adjustment and you wake up one day and you're like, what, you know what? I'm going to start a podcast and all this shit going on. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and that was it because, and I, I think sometimes it's almost cliche, but I feel like we live in a, in a culture in a country, whatever to where we're all, we're all looking for happiness, right? We're all, mm-hmm. we're all seeking it. We're all trying to find it. But the truth is, is that 
I feel like it, it comes from within. And I feel like so many times, because like I said, Jim, like I, I had the, the multi six figure job. I had, you know, the, the badass pickup, you know, I mean, I got grief about it cause I, you know, I'm always going to be country, even if I'm living down in the bigger city, right? Like now, what, what, kind of, <laughs> what kind of pickup are we talking? You, you're not a uh, Dodge driver, right? I used to be, I graduated into a, <laughs> into a Duramax, a GMC. Oh, okay. Okay. I yeah. knew we'd get along then. I just make it sure. <laughs> yeah. Drive one of those loud stinky Dodges around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I used to, but, but no, I got the GFC and I'm keeping it. But yeah, like, I mean, I had, I, I feel like I had all of it. Um, and I know, I hope that doesn't sound arrogant. Right. But like I do, I feel like, oh. like we had the awesome house. We had the, the awesome vehicles, right? Like we had the perfect little family, you know, the wife, the kids, the, the dogs, the blah, blah, you know, I had seven acres, you know, which kind of gave me that little country outside of the city and, and everything else. But there's like this, there was like this thing that was still missing. And I think that a lot of people feel that way based on conversations I've had. And I think it's a lot of men, especially, right? Yeah. And so when I started the Primal King podcast, I was like, okay, I feel like there's kind of three pillars that I want to focus this around. I want to focus it around liberation, lifestyle, and legacy. So like with the liberation side of it, it's kind of that mindset. Sometimes when you grow up the way I did, we're very poor, especially for the first several years of my life. I mean, like very, like dirt floor poor, right? Like literally in our bedroom, me and, um, you know, my brother and sister, we, we shared a bedroom. There's partial dirt floor in it. Like, like it was, we were poor, right? But Dude, that I didn't is, know that is, that is authentic Idaho yeah. range lifestyle right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but when you grow up that way, sometimes you look at that money as maybe being evil or you look at all these different things. And I don't think it is. I think money's a tool. Um, mm-hmm. and so like for part of me, when I, when I did get into more of the business side of this and, and into the internet marketing and software stuff where I was working at click funnels, um, like I started realizing like having money is not a bad thing. Like I know a lot of people who have a bunch of money and they're great people. Right. Yeah. And so that kind of shifted my mindset as to different possibilities. And so I felt like kind of the first pillar of the podcast needed to be like a mindset adjustment for so many of us. Like what is important to us? For some people, maybe it is money. For other people, it's family. For And I'm not here to judge what's important. I can just, I try to tell the story of, of maybe the, the things that I've learned, right? Sure. The second thing is lifestyle because I feel like so often now, having talked about money, right, we put money above our lifestyle. So for me, like I, I, I do not want to live a, a life by default, right? And I, what I mean by that is, is going to a job that I hate, working for someone that I don't like or I don't respect or anything like that, having someone else tell me what I can or can't earn mm-hmm. or, you know, just kind of being stuck in this, in this bubble. And so to me, I feel like if you can design a lifestyle that you want to live, you can figure out how to make the money to do that, to, to facilitate that. But I feel like so many of us, we live so scared because we have debt, we have, you know, family, we have obligations that we kind of put that lifestyle thing away until we get to be 65 and then we go fishing for a couple of years and we die. And it's like, okay, was that really a life? Right? Yeah. Like, like have your lifestyle, man. Like if you want to hunt and fish, like figure out how to get paid to do that or figure out a, a career that you can be in that allows you to do those things because that's the stuff that fills you up. That's right? so and then, important and such a great point, Derek, because you even, uh, you had a, you had a podcast episode recently that talked about like kind of living in this comfort zone and, and why that's dangerous because it, you get, and I'm guilty of that where I, I get in this comfort zone where, okay, bills are paid. You know, I've got, I, and I centered my career around hunting. I, I chose a career path that allowed me to take like, for example, in this last September, I hunted 20, 22 days, uh, out of the month. And, and that, that is what is important to me. And, and I, I chose a career path that, you know, that, that can have a major impact on my income or it could have very little impact on my income. It depends on what I do the month prior to that. Right. And so, um, that that's such an important point and what I want a lot of people in my audience to get out of the, the point that you're making um, this, this lifestyle. And I love the liberation concept and you, uh, a- anyways, I'm going off on a tangent there. I want to, I want to circle back to a lot of this and talk about it, but, uh, continue on with, with, uh, kind of the three pillars of, of your podcast. Yeah. So, so again, it, it's the liberation side, kind of the mindset side, because I see so many things too, um, just to kind of circle back as to why I guess I put them in that order, because you see generational wealth and you see generational poverty. And I know that right now there's a lot of like social justice stuff going on and talking and and I don't want to get into the political side of that, but I feel like the one thing 
Well, let, let me tell you, just stop you right there. You, yeah. the, on this podcast, I, I used to have this mindset, well, let's not bump into politics. Let's not do this. I don't give a damn where we go with this. If, if this is, this is, uh, we can get as raw and real as, as, as you want with this on this show and, and talk uh, as, you know, in depth with that as you want. Nice. Don't be well, shy. Yeah, but well, the, the funny thing is, is that some, everything's political now anyways, I guess. So it doesn't really matter. But, I know. I know. But I mean, you get into these, into these places where you see generational poverty and you see generational wealth and, and it's always like, okay, why are, why is it fair that these people have generational wealth and these people have generational poverty? And it's like, do you know the one thing in my opinion that separates generational wealth from generational poverty? What's that? It's a mindset. Mm-hmm. It's a mindset, right? Good because I know people who who are wealthy, but they've been broke, but they've never been poor, right? They've been mm-hmm. broke. Like businesses go, si- I've, I've been broke, right? Like yeah. businesses go sideways, but the thing that gets them back to where they were, because you see this, the average millionaire goes bankrupt X many times, like all these statistics, right? But it's like, yeah. okay, why do those people keep battling back? And it's because they have the mindset, they have the work ethic, they have those things that separate them from that victim mindset and again, I'm not trying to overgeneralize, but most people who live in generational poverty, they need to have a different mindset. They need to understand the, the, the principles of, of success and work ethic and spending your time doing things uh, that are productive and, and kind of thinking about things with the end in mind, right? Like, it, are the things I'm doing today going to benefit me in five years from now? Does Whereas that, I feel like a... Oh, go ahead. D- does that like... The, this generational poverty thing that you're talking about, do you feel like that there's this sense of victimhood that gets passed down in those generations? Cause, cause that's how I feel. Like I, yes. I feel like they, they, they get this mindset where it's like, we're deprived of pursuing our dreams because of this, uh, you know, social structure or this thing that, that we're born into the neighborhood we live in. Uh, the color of our, of our skin, the the schools we have available to us, the you know all these things are or or, or the the one that always gets me is is rich people hold us down. You ever go hunting with somebody that always chintzes out on like the most important thing, like boots? I did a couple times, and you know what happened? They slipped and fell down the mountain the entire month of September. That's what happens when you buy $100 boots and and try to make them last. They don't last. Guys, Hoffman Boots, can't say enough good things about this company. It's a great family-owned business right here in North Idaho. They make badass boots. These things are insanely, insanely comfortable. They just glue your feet to the mountain in the steepest of conditions. They will keep you safer because of that. So while my buddies are falling on their butt the entire time, I'm walking down like I'm in the park. Guys, I have a great promo code that'll save you 15% if you go to hoffmanboots.com. It is all caps lock, Huntsman15 in the checkout when you are ready for a new pair of great boots that you won't have to replace for a very long time. Guys, Scree. Scree is Extreme Mountain Gear. They were one of the first sponsors of this podcast. And this high-performance hunting attire and gear is its scientifically tested camo patterns, backed by a great company, and it's got a lifetime warranty, VIP sizing, and, and, and exchange program. Basically, if you if you order it and it's the wrong size, they pay for it to get shipped back, and they're going to send it back. I heard of some dude that accidentally ripped uh, a pair of his hard scrabble pants, and he was upset about it, and he let Scree know, and they replaced them for him. Guys, this is a great company. That's the kind of company that I am proud to have supporting this show and being partnered with them uh it's just again a great company story and and, and a company that you guys would be proud to own the gear for it'll get you through any season anywhere in north america Check it out at ScreeGear.com and use the promo code the Western Huntsman for 15% off and free shipping at checkout. And last, but by far not least, Phelps Game Calls. Guys, Phelps Game Calls, uh, I, I, you guys, if you've listened to any of these episodes, uh, as I, as I kind of dissected my last September, I had so many bull elk encounters using these calls and I used everything from the pink Maverick to the Ma- or the pink amp to the Maverick. I used the Renegade bugle tube. I used a couple of their external read calls. I uh, just had a ball calling in elk left and right hand over fist and because these calls work. Obviously they work well. It's not just about that though. Guys, Jason Phelps started this company from scratch 
and built it into what it is now. The company, the game call company that we all know well. And I, I just, I think that that is so important. These the, these American companies that are born out of an idea and they grow into this this thing that, that we can all get behind and love and support and the, and the personalities and the people behind it, that's Phelps Game Calls. Salt of the Earth company, salt of the earth people that run it. And I can't say enough good things about Phelps Game Calls. Don't forget, it's not just about elk with Phelps. You get you a, a, a black ta- a blacktail in distress call and watch those deer come into you while they're rutting because it fires up those, those does. And what do you think is right behind those does during the rut? November's coming. Make sure you're getting your deer calls as well. So check it out at phelpsgamecalls.com and use the promo code HUNTSMAN10 for 10% off at sh- uh, checkout. I keep wanting to say shipping. (laughs) That's how I roll. All right, guys. With that said, thank you to the sponsors of this show. Let's get back to the discussion. Hope you guys are enjoying the show. We'll talk to you later. And I, I, it's, it's, it's a concept that I've never really talked about on my show, but it kind of drives me crazy because I feel like exactly what you're saying with, with the right mindset. And I need coaching from guys like you a lot because I, I'm, I'm one of those, I'm, I'm a highly emotional guy, right? I, I, I have, I have major highs and lows. And when I say lows, it's not like I go into a depression or anything, but my lows come from, uh, if I'm not, if I don't have a successful week at work or, or if something happens with a podcast, I get, I get pretty down about it and and vice versa. If I have a great week, man, I'm on top of the world. And, and sometimes that, that roller coaster ride could be detrimental. But uh, getting back to what you were saying, this, this victimhood mentality, I think, is born out of what you're talking about with this generational po- poverty. And it kind of leads to this entitlement mindset where people want to blame successful people. And, and like, I've never gotten a job from a poor person. So, uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm good with people that, that are successful and, and have money. And they're the ones that create the opportunities for others to create that kind of wealth and lifestyle. Am I off base? No, no. And, and I mean, as far as like the roller coaster, like, I mean, congratulations, you're normal, right? Like we all go through that. But I think yeah. that one of the things that separates kind of the, I don't know if you want to call them successful people from maybe the ones who aren't are how long do you stay there, right? Mm-hmm. Because we're all going to lose a job. We're all going to have a business go bad. We're all going to have relationships. Like we all like in this human experience, we all have that stuff happen, but how long do you stay there? You know, do you lose a job? And so then you, you sit on unemployment for the next eight months feeling sorry for yourself or do you maybe, I mean, Hey, like, yeah, maybe you need some unemployment to bridge the gap and to keep your family fed. I mean, I'm not against the like, like stuff like that. Some of the safety stuff. Right. But what are you doing between this job and the next job? Are you educating yourself? I mean, literally like you can go on Google right now and figure out how to build a rocket ship, right. For free. Like you can literally go on Google right now and learn how to build a rocket ship for free. So you're telling me though that you should stay broke because you can't learn how to be a journeyman electrician, right? Or you can't learn how to, whatever it may be. It, it, this isn't like a, a white collar thing versus a blue collar thing. It's, it's about a skill thing. And that was one of the big things, I guess, that I started to learn is it's like, you know, what are you doing in your spare time? If you're watching Netflix six hours a day when you get home from work and then you're pissed that you don't make enough money, like, I mean, come on. And I'm not trying to call anybody out, but I mean, just think about like we have more access to more resources now than any human has ever had in the existence of this planet, right? So Mm -hmm. what are we doing with them? Are we, are we, are we using all of these resources to say rich people are bad and they're holding me down because I happened like at my last job when, when I was working at ClickFunnels, I worked for a super, super wealthy person. But here's the thing because all this tax stuff comes up, right? And I remember having a conversation with a family member of mine about taxes and, oh yeah, tax the rich. And I was like, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like that, right? Like, yeah, pay, pays taxes, but like I watched my boss who now is running a hundred million dollar a year business, right? So this isn't some small deal. But in the very beginning, I was there with him and I watched him show up before me. Uh, I, I watched him stay later than me. Mm-hmm. He has five kids. He sacrificed a ton of time with his kids, sacrificed a ton of time with his wife. He took a lot of arrows uh, because he was kind of the face of the company. And when things didn't go well, that guy was getting raked over the coals. I watched him work 20 hours a day. And so now that he's been able to build that into a hundred million dollar a year business, like we should penalize him more. Like really? I I agree. He's He's a good guy that, that sacrificed everything to get to where he's at. Like, why do we want to penalize that guy? Like we should look at him and be like, what did he do to become successful? And then 
I don't know, like maybe try to model it, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, totally agree. I, I, I always put it into this context. Like I have, I, I, I'm going to use somebody that I know very well as, as an example, because I think that, that we have, or, or people have this tendency to like paint this broad picture of what millionaire, millionaires are, right? Yep. They, there's this, uh, oh man, it's really snowing outside the studio now. Oh, <laughs> shoot. I'm not ready for this. Anyway, um, we, we have this, this picture, like everybody's a Jeff Bezos and, and they drive these fancy sports cars and they flaunt their money kind of thing. And, and I don't know if Jeff Bezos does that, but uh, you know, that's the image that a lot of times Hollywood and the media likes to portray. The real average millionaire is not like that. I'll give you an example. I used to work for this guy that started a company here in North Idaho out of his garage. It's a heating and air conditioning company. Uh, and he, he's, he's, a, he's a friend of mine now. But I, I, how I got to know him is uh, he interviewed me for a, for a position and uh, he hired me and I got to watch this guy for about five years of my life. Take this company from this very small business out of his garage where there's there. I, when I started, there was like six employees. The guy's a millionaire now. He's got 50, 60 employees. He, the, the, the company probably does somewhere around $10 million a year in a smaller community. This is not like, a, we don't live in some big metro area. Uh, his name is Tony. And so I'll give you an example of what I mean by the, the, the flaunting. The, the guy was driving this old piece of crap Chevy and he's on his way. He lives kind of out by where I do out, out in the sticks. He hits an elk in this Chevy on the way home. The guy can go to a, any car dealer in, in the area and, and buy himself a brand new truck cash, hands down. He's, he's got the money for that. But what does he do instead? He goes in, to this junkyard and buys a front panel for the truck that doesn't even match the rest of the truck. So he's driving around this millionaire in this truck that is just falling apart and it's got this black panel and, and the rest of the truck is white. And uh, he doesn't give a shit, man. He, he doesn't yeah. care. This is, this is his life. That's his money. That's his decision. Y- you'd never know the guy was a millionaire, but he is. Yeah. And, and he's a well, good and I, dude and he's a super inspirational guy. I'd love to get him on the show actually. Yeah. And I had, I had a conversation with someone on, on Facebook uh, a while back, kind of in the comments section, right? Where I, I really try to stay out of it. But some of these things, um, because it was, it was that, that meme of Biden's tax proposal going around to where if you're over 400K a year, you get it's like 62% in California or some with all the state taxes, everything else. And someone yes. was like, well, yeah, it's, it's okay for the ultra rich. And I was sitting there, I was like, you know, I had a year, I don't know, it's been a few years back when I was still working at ClickFunnels to where I made over 400,000 in a year. And mm-hmm. what most people don't realize though, is that you live, you can live well on that. But that same year um, was like the year before we moved up here, I guess it would have been. And so that same year on that 400,000, uh, and we live in Idaho with relatively low state tax, but even still, I remember doing my taxes at the end of the year, looking at it being like, I could have just sent like two of my kids through college with what I paid in taxes this year, just yeah. in one year, right? Mm-hmm. And we were living well, but again, when you personalize it and you realize we weren't, you know, I, don't, I didn't have a, a helicopter, I didn't have a private jet, I wasn't living this crazy, crazy life, you know, lavish lifestyle, we did well. But that same year too, I had $40,000 that I paid in lawyer fees to be able to buy my stepmom out and go through that whole mess. That same Mm -hmm. year we put like 25 grand into our house to be able to sell it so we could move back. Like, you know, you, you think about all of this money, but when you make it to where you see somebody who's actually doing that and you're like, Oh, well they probably don't need to be penalized. They're just good, normal people. You know, it's like we have this vision of some, some old dude sitting in a, in a Manhattan boardroom that's, you know, like Scrooge. And it's funny because actually yeah. the podcast I dropped today was kind of around this, this topic, right? But it's like we get this vision of, of who we're taxing when we get those evil rich people. And it's like, you know, you might be advocating to tax your neighbor hire that's actually a really good guy, right? And he's just trying yeah. to do the best he can. He's trying to raise a family, trying to put some money away, trying to, you know, improve his house maybe a little bit. That guy doesn't need to be penalized because he, he figured out how to make some good money, right? And so I don't, I don't I think know it, where that this whole concept comes from even. Like, where did the idea of penalizing success even come from in our society? Th- this is not the, the, the America that our founding fathers imagined to, to no. penalize people that work their butts off and, and are successful. And, and I know we're going down a rabbit hole here, but uh, it, it, it really is frustrating. Like, you don't have some entitled say to my money. 
right? right? I don't have some kind of entitled say to somebody else's money. Like, like the guy I was talking about, I don't, I don't have some kind of right to Tony's money the, or, or anybody else that is successful in that, that way. The guy worked his butt off, like you were saying, 16, yep. 20 hour days to, to get to that point. And so I, I, where does that come from? Where, where does that mindset well, even come from? I, I think, um, and again, it's, it's, it's crazy that we're on this topic right now because I, I talked about it uh, in, my, in my podcast today. But I think, so there, there's a guy named Jim Rohn who's like kind of one of the old school like self-development guys. And he, and he talks about this um, and he says, you know, there's two ways to have the tallest building in town. Number one is to build your building the tallest. Number two is to knock everybody else's down. And I feel like we're at a point in our culture right now to where if you don't have everything you feel like you deserve, you want to go and knock everybody else's building down so you can be the tallest. Man, so rather than us, yeah, uh, rather than us individually focusing on how can I be the best that I can be, yeah. right? Like how can I be the best version of myself? How can I build my business? How can I be the best employee? Whatever else, we would rather look at somebody else and be like, that guy sucks right? <laughs> like yeah. I want to tear that guy down because it's going to make me feel a little better. It's going to make me have the biggest building. And I feel like, you know, we have this, this victim mindset now going on to where if I don't have everything I want, it's not my fault. It's your fault, right? It's Jim's yeah. fault that I'm not where I need to be. So I need to penalize Jim, right? Mm -hmm. Like I need to tell you that you're racist. I need to tell you that you make too much money. I need to tell you whatever I can, because at this point, my building isn't tall enough. So the only way I'm going to get there is to tear yours down. And I feel like it all does come back to that victim mindset. And I feel like, you know, cause I remember my dad even, you know, talking about some rich asshole driving down the road in the Beamer, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, maybe he's not though. Like maybe it's just a good guy that wanted a Beamer. I don't know. You yeah. know, but like when you kind of grow up with that ingrained in you and yeah, there's probably a lot of rich assholes that drive Beamers. I'm sure there are, but like, oh, there definitely you is. Know, it was, yeah. But it was kind of like that mentality. And so then I was like, okay, I don't, I don't think I want to be rich. And I don't think I ever want to have a Beamer because my dad's going to think I'm an asshole. Right. Like, you know, and so you kind of grow up with that mindset and then you realize like, no, there's good people that drive Beamers, just like there's assholes that drive GMCs. Right. Like, like, you know, you can't like yeah, stereotype it's, it's, everybody. It's like that in every group. Every group has that, you know, poor, there's, there's some poor assholes and there's some yep. uh, poor people that are salt of the earth. Same with the middle class, same with rich people. It's, yep. it's really, you know, it's, it's not, not the, this class envy thing or, or the, the societal characterizations that, that people have are not what define the individual and the individual defines himself. And that's, that's, I think where I get frustrated, like with today's politics, you know, and, and, and how nasty it's become, first of all, oh gosh, uh, awful. it's like, I can't even watch the news anymore because they're, I'm getting, I'm getting lied to no matter who I watch. Yep. And, and it's yep. just, it's just out of control with, like I've got, I've got family members that are saying that due to the fact that it's an election year, they're not going to even have a Thanksgiving dinner this year. They're going to just avoid it uh, because they, they're going to be, I, I think that, I, and I don't want to make assumptions, but I, there's a, there's a pretty good chance that the Trumpster gets reelected, reelected here in a couple of weeks. And mm -hmm. if that does happen, they're going to be pretty bent out of shape about it. And, and, yeah. you, you know, and, and so they're like, yeah. oh, we're not going to have a Thanksgiving dinner. I, I don't understand where that comes from because when I was a kid, when I was growing up, politics was always a good debate topic and, and people, people could have conversations about it without ruining relationships. And, and it's gotten to this point now where it just ruins relationships. People are so, so angry and polarized and, and we can't, it's, I feel like sometimes it's taboo to even talk about it on the podcast because I might make somebody really, really mad, you know, but you know, I, I, I'm just, I'm at that point where I just watched Trump smoke Biden in a debate last night and that there's really no other choice for me. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't care who knows it. I am who I am and you are who you are. If you're, if you're a Biden supporter, you're still welcome at my house for Thanksgiving. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. That's just well, I think so much, so much of this comes back to adversity, right. And, and comfort zone. Because the way that I look at this stuff right now is that the only way that we get out of this, you know, whether it's, it's personal life stuff, whether it's, it's cultural stuff, political stuff, like to me, it's, it's to have an open mind about things right? mm -hmm. and to have open dialogue. If someone thinks that Biden should be elected, great. Like, tell me why, right? Like, I'll listen to you. I'm not going to sit there and just call you an idiot, right? Like, I want to know why. Like, why do you believe that? Obviously, yeah. I, I feel differently. I'm more in line with you. Like, I'm, I, I support Trump. 
Does that mean yeah. that I support everything about him? No. But at the yeah, same time, and, and like, that, that's that, where we've become, right? Like we've become to where if you like Trump, you have to like every single thing about him. You have to love it if he calls some woman a whatever, or you have to love yeah. it when he, no, it's like, I, I do I like it. Policies, I, do, I do like it when he picks on Rosie O'Donnell, but other than that, yeah, I know. Uh, you know, yeah. I, do I think <laughs> I mean, Trump's who an asshole? I mean, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> right. The guy's just kind of, he's pretty raw and real that way, but yeah. do, do I think Trump's an asshole? Yeah, he is an asshole. Yeah. Uh, do but sometimes think, your, your high school football coach is an asshole too, right? Exactly. But yet he like, gets everything out of you. Yeah, he does. And, and I just, I, I, I have this sense that like my, our company and, and, and things like that, you know, the economy, everything else is, we're not, I'm not trying to justify a politician actually. I, I, we don't need to go there. Yeah. But I, I think that if, if you hate Trump with such vigor, that you think I'm an asshole because I'm going to vote for him, you're wrong. That yeah. is actually the true definition of bigotry. So quit throwing yeah, yeah. around the word bigotry yeah. like, like you know what you're even talking about. It's, that's not what a bigot is. And well, so, when you talk about fascism, right? Like fascism, I don't have the literal definition for it, but basically fascism is, is you're not tolerant to any other ideas, right? Exactly. And so what, what could be more closely related to fascism than someone who's saying, I don't even want to hear your ideas because you are a bad person because you vote for Trump. Right? Yeah, like it, to me, I mean, it's crazy. And, and so that's where, you know, kind of to come full circle. I know that I, got, I went off on a tangent there with the political stuff, but you know, when it comes to like the liberation and the mindset of things, like I feel like having an open mind, having, having the understanding that not everything that happens to you means you're a victim, right? Like we all go through bad stuff, but it's like, how do you break the mindset that no, not every rich person is an asshole. Not every Trump supporter is a racist. Not every, you know, Biden supporter is whatever, right? Wants like, to take your, not every Biden supporter wants to take your guns away. Right. Yeah. And so, but, but see, like if, if you're thinking in a small and a victim mindset, that's where you get stuck is on those things. And again, I, even I in your own life, right? Like if, if, if you're not where you're at in life, like it's really easy to be like, yeah, if I hadn't, you know, torn my shoulder when I was, a, you know, my senior year of summer, I'd be in the NFL, right? Because that actually happened to me. I tore my labrum. I was, I was going to go play college football as a quarterback, tore my labrum, ended up one thing after the other. I never even played a snap in college, right? And mm -hmm. so it's like, should I, could I look back and be like, yeah, if I hadn't done that, maybe I'd be in the, no, right? Like everything, it happened to me, right? Like it happened, like things happen. I can be bitter about it or I can understand that, hey, that was just my path and I can make the best of what came after that. As rather than get, I mean, you'll, you'll talk to some people that are 65 years old that are being like, yeah, if I broke my ankle, I would have freaked, I would have had a better life. Right. Or yeah, that woman hadn't yeah. left me when I was 22 and took everything. I, it's like, man, like at some point, if you want to have a growth mindset, like you have to start thinking about, okay, what can I do? Not what people do to me, not exterior, right? Like what can I internally do to, to grow my skill set, to grow my mindset, to be a better person tomorrow than I am today. And all of a sudden things start falling into place, right? And then with the lifestyle, again, just figuring out what type of lifestyle you want. For some of us, like you, Jim, for me, like we're small town people. I, I remember, um, it was crazy. So like three months into moving back, uh, it, was, it was deer season, right? And mm -hmm. like we were going through the, this house stuff. I mean, it was, it was a nightmare, like I said. We, we barely could live in part of the house. The contractor was not showing up, like all this stuff was going on. Right. And mm -hmm. like, I'm trying to work and I'm trying to then basically I ended up kind of taking over the remodel just so we could have it done. It was getting close to winter. And it was just like, you know, I had that thought for a second, like this was stupid. And, and in fact, our other house that we had moved from hadn't sold yet. And I was like, you know, it's not too late. Like that, that was a thought going, it's like, it's not too late. We can move yeah. back. We could sell the ranch, put some money in the bank account. Like, like it's not too late. But then it's weird, like call it, like I call it God, maybe other people call it the universe or whatever. But I remember I was up deer hunting and I was sitting on this ridge and it was just a perfect morning, right? And I remember it started snowing and it was just, like I said, it was dead calm. It was beautiful, nice little perfect snowflakes coming down. And I remember, I remember sitting there thinking like, this is why. Like, this is why we're doing this, right? Like, this yeah. is the lifestyle. I want to be You're able hunting to on, on the ranch there? Yep. Yep. Hunting on the ranch. Yep. Yeah. And so I'm sitting there on our ranch, you know, rifle in my hand, bundled up, snow coming down, beautiful morning, you know, just calm, no wind, no nothing. And I'm like, this is why, because 
this is the lifestyle that I want. And this is the lifestyle that I want for my kids. And so, yeah, everything may feel like it's falling apart or it's not moving as fast as I want. I was like, this is it. I don't, I don't know how. Right. And I think that so often we get stuck in this. How do we do it? Right. Yeah. But I feel like it's, it's kind of like eating an elephant one bite at a time. And, and for me, it was like, we'll just take this first bite right now and then we'll see. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so a lot of things change. You know, I walked away from kind of my cushy salary because it was like, this is a lifestyle. I'll figure it out. I'll be able to do things on my own. Right. Um, and then it kind of takes us into the third pillar, which is legacy. I was, you know, I, cause I always kept thinking like my dad, my dad never had money, right? Like he was lucky a lot of times on the ranch to make 20, 30 grand on a great year. He'd make more most years he'd make less, but like he was, he was kind of one of those larger than life people. Like he was out doing cowboy shit, right? Like he's out riding his horse in the mountains doing stuff that people just don't do anymore. And so if life, someone needed, yeah, yeah. If someone needed help, they had a sick animal. My dad was like a semester away from being a vet. Um, when he moved back to help my great grandpa on the ranch. And so he, he knew all that stuff about like, you know, being able to help people's animals. And so everybody knew him. And it was like, you know, like when he died, the amount of people that showed up to his funeral was insane. People from all over the, like, like all over the country. And it's like, this guy lived in Riggins, Idaho, you know, 400 people. And he's got, because, you know, he guided in Alaska and he, you know, he had hunters that would come out from other parts of the country and just meet people here and there. And, I was just like, man, like he had a legacy. He didn't have all the money in the world. He didn't have any money. Like he had land, I guess, but, but he didn't have money. He didn't have a nice vehicle. He didn't have a nice house. But I was like, he had a, a legacy to where when he died, people showed up, you know, talking mm -hmm. about what a great guy he was, how he would help people out, the lifestyle that he lived, how people envied what he was willing to do. And I was like, you know what? Like I need to do a podcast, right? Like I, That's I need awesome. to- yeah, I need to get this message out there because again, like for those of us who have tried the rat race and who have sat in traffic to go to a job and who have thought that, you know, making that big money is going to be the best thing ever. It's like, man, what kind of legacy do you want though? Do you want your legacy just to be that you made a bunch of money or do you want your legacy to be that you, you spent time with your kids? You took them hunting if that's what you're into, right? Or you took them to their soccer games or you you know, I mean, like right now, a lot of schools are shut down. Were you able to actually help your kids with their school or were you, you know, from one business meeting to the next and everything else? And it was like, you know, I don't feel like there's enough people. You have these Gary V type people out there just saying hustle and grind and work your hands to the bone. And I'm like, no, nah, man, like I don't want to do that. I, I'm all for hard work. Yeah. But yeah. I actually had a guy talk to me the other day and it made complete sense. It's like I want an integrated lifestyle, right? Like I don't want my family to be over on one side and my business to be on the other. Like I want it all together. Like I want, cause like even with our, our direct to consumer meat business, right? Like my kids help me feed. They help me go out there and take care of the animals. They, you know, they're in the, in the can am when we're cruising around checking stuff out, like they're helping us with this business. And so I don't have to choose like, do I hang out with my kids today or do I try to make some money? No, I want to integrate all that together. So that way my kids can learn from me, hopefully, and see what it takes to run a business and see, yes, there are some nights when me and my wife are up late trying to figure out stupid marketing stuff, right? Or shipping rates and all this other nightmare stuff. But at the same time, guess what? It's me and my wife doing it, right? Like, mm -hmm. like we're a team. My family's there. My kids are there. And, and so it was like, you know, I want my legacy to be like, I, I included my kids within, within my life, right? Like I, I want them to be a part of it. I don't want it to be separate. And I think that again, there's just not enough people out there trying to speak to this message. I don't think there's enough people out there that are putting value on family and traditional values and, you know, all of that type of stuff that maybe it's out of style, but I don't think it is. Like, I love the fact I have an awesome marriage, right? I'm, I'm stoked yeah. about it. I'm excited about it. There's, there's First, value. There's a lot yeah. of value in there that I think a lot of people miss out on in their quest to change the traditional American lifestyle, like the, the, and, and I'm not trying to preach to anybody, but there, the, there's a lot of value and fulfillment in that lifestyle. It, the, the time that you spend with your, your kids, the quality time that you have with your wife and having them included in a business and living on a ranch and, and, and you don't have to live on a ranch for this kind of, this kind of legacy or, or American traditional value that, uh, that has so much fulfillment, I, I guess I, I should say, because, yeah. you know, I don't live on a big, I, I wish I did. I'd, I'd love to 
have a big ranch like that and and have that, uh, that, that that's a great business, by the way, the crossroad meats. We're going to talk about that in just a minute, but um I, we've got, we've got very little acreage. We've, you know, we've got a few acres out in the woods and, and we could hunt on it and uh, we can, we, we could do what we want on it. And I'm like you, I include my kids in everything that I do. We homeschool our kids so that they're, they, they get a, a full experience in, in the, the lifestyle that we live. Uh, my, my nine-year-old is a Comanche level blood trailer for elk, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, and she, yeah. she can do that and, and she's out there doing it. And, and those, those memories are going to be with her forever. Um, and, and there, that's, that's what it's about that le- it feeds into this legacy that, uh, my dad and my mom, they were there all the time. Right. And that's what I want my kids to feel that I, w- we are a staple in their life for as long as we're on this earth, we're, we're a staple and they're included in our lives. And, and that's what, that's what we want. And that is, I feel like that's what you're doing. And I've got this nagging question now. I, I need to get it out before yeah, I forget yeah. on your ranch. Do you have more mule deer or whitetail deer? So we actually, it's, it's about half and half. Which is it? Is awesome for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the whitetail, are they hanging kind of in the lower country and you got to go yep. up the muleys? So like directly behind our house is a, just a huge mountain. So we live like at the bottom, kind of by the highway, um, off highway 95, but, but back behind us, the mountain just goes straight up and about halfway up is, is seems to be about the divider line between the whitetail and the muleys. So we actually have some really, really nice muleys up high. We don't have like for you, I, I would say compared to North Idaho, uh, very big whitetail here. I shot, I don't know. It's probably been 10 years ago. I shot like a 145, and that that's big for here, you know. Shoot, man, and, I'd I'd be tickled with a 145. Oh, I well, he's 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 hanging on my wall. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, those are few and far between here. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty cool because we have we have uh, you know whitetail down low. We have the muley up high. You know, elk. Uh, unfortunately, wolves. Sorry if that offends people, but it's true. Um, you know, we've kind of had some problems with them and, and, uh, yeah, bears have, got everything. Do you have anybody set up, lined up to trap the wolves on your property at all or? Yeah. So we've, <clears throat> we've done a lot with the government trapping, um, just because they've, they've gotten crazy over the past several years. Yeah. I know that Colorado is talking about to do it. Uh, if you're in Colorado, don't do it. Do everything yeah. you can to keep those things from coming there. They are awful. Uh, I know that people love to see wolves in the wild, but coming from someone who runs cows, uh, you know, we, we do hunts here. It's, it's, oh gosh, it's, it's, it's not, it's not good. It's well, not I don't, good. I don't know how much of my podcast you listen to, but that's, that's a huge topic on our show. Uh, we, you know, and, and, and the policy of, or, or I, I don't know if it's a policy, the stance, my stance is I, I love wolves. Yeah. I think they're an incredible animal but I don't believe that they should have been reintroduced to the landscape uh, no. the, we, in, in the, the way that, that the modern day society is set up and, and uh, civilization, so to speak, with highways and cities and our public lands and national park systems. Uh, they, they really don't belong in the state of Idaho. I, I mean, well, and, and, and there's a I, lot of evidence. This is an, uh, this is not like an emotional based um, stance. This is, this is a fact and evidence based stance. They, they don't jive on our landscape and, and they, unfortunately they're here and it was all brought on by emotions and not facts. And, and now we got to deal with them. And so I remember my dad talking about it, uh, when they were talking about reintroducing them, what was it? Late nineties or, or whatever, I think is when yeah, it was 19, 1995 is when they first yeah. released them. Okay. And I remember him going to meetings and stuff, trying to get them because, what what people don't understand, and again, like if, if you think the wolf reintroduction is a good idea, what people don't understand is that if if they kill a couple calves, you know, for ranchers, that can be the difference in making money and not making money in a year, right? Yeah. I, I've had like one viral post, I think, probably ever in, on, on Facebook, and I don't know, it's got like thousands of shares or whatever, and it was about that because just north of us here, they caught on a game camera, uh, wolves taken down a couple caps, like literally pictures of them, you know, mouth around the neck type stuff. Mm-hmm. And that can be the difference. And, and I know that there's those people, like I actually have people in my family, like distant family that are like, well, you know, it doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't matter. Don't run your cows there. Don't blah, blah, blah. Right. But because it's they, number one. It's 
it's it's the Walmart mindset. They think that yes. there's there's thousands of calves calves behind it to replace it. But what they don't understand is that is the that could be the difference between you providing a Christmas for your children, yeah, and not. Yep. Well, and not only that, but like I don't know, it's probably been seven eight years ago. My dad's up moving cows by himself, and he had his three cow dogs with him, and uh, people just don't understand, I guess, like how like types of killing machines they are. So he was up way up high and you know, there's, there's like squirrels and stuff running around. And when you're riding with your cow dogs, they take off after every squirrel, you know, whatever <clears throat> my dad's mm-hmm. riding through there and all three of the dogs took off, figured, you know, after a squirrel, nobody, you know, I didn't even think twice of it. He said, he heard some yelping and he said, it, he's like, it couldn't have taken me more than four or five, like maybe three to four minutes, maybe five minutes max to get over to where he heard the yelp and come from. And he said, by the time he got over there, he said there was a radius of about 20 feet of blood, chunks of his cow dogs left. And the wolves had already torn apart and been gone by the time he heard the first yelp to when he got over there. It's freaking so, nuts. They killed yeah, all three dogs, all three dogs dead. Yeah. Jeez. Just completely. And, and again, like, like because people dogs. don't understand. Yeah. I mean, and they're mean, right? Like a lot of do- like, yeah, lot of cow I mean, dogs, and, and you know, they're, they're an, big, but they're also an asset. I mean, they, these are yeah. working dogs. You need these dogs on a ranch like this for, for anybody that hasn't worked a cattle ranch. Th- these are an asset. Th- this is yeah. not, you know, a, a, a poodle, um, a labradoodle, little fluffy yeah. dog l- laying in front of the, the fireplace that is great to have. But th- these are, these are actual working dogs that are a necessity for a cattle ranch. Yep. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was one of those things to where it's devastating because when, when you, when you run cows in this country, they're, you know, it's very brushy and it's very steep and being able to have some good cow dogs is, you know, I mean, it reduces your workload by, I don't know, 50% maybe in some cases. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, yeah. So yeah, doing that. And then, you know, calves coming in, there was one year, my daughter, my oldest daughter was absolutely traumatized because a wolf had got a hold of a calf and it didn't kill it, but it, basically turned it into like a Quasimodo to where it had all this scar tissue and stuff on its neck. So it walked with its head sideways and it made it for like a year and then died. Um, you know, just stuff Jeez. like that, just killing and maiming them. Uh, and like I do said, you, they've, they've been pretty heavy here. Um, but, but yeah, I just, do you have like a, a number or a figure on, on about how many calves you've lost to, to wolves? It's hard to say for sure, because when they come in in the fall, like, like this time of year, um, there's always going to be some that don't come in some of them that just die for whatever reason. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, but I mean, it's, I mean, I, I would, I would venture to say it's, it's tens and tens of thousands of dollars over the past, probably 10 years, maybe, you know? Mm-hmm. And, That's and like crazy. I said, if you're, if you're a rancher making 20, 30 grand a year, um, that ends up being a lot of money, you know, that's a, that's it can a huge be chunk, yeah. yeah, 30% of your income on bad years, right? Like, mm-hmm. like not having those. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a tough deal, man. It's, it is. And, and I get the people that are like, oh, you know, they're, they're these cool, majestic animals. Yes, they're awesome. I mean, you see a wolf in the wild and it's like, they're beautiful animals. But when you see the destruction and you think about how much revenue that a state could lose over not selling tax, like I know people who, who stopped hunting that used to always hunt. They said, we go into our place where we hunt and there's just wolf sign everywhere. We just stop yeah, doing it. It's a pretty you know? common so thing. Yeah. Yeah. F- yeah super it's, common it's thing for sure. And, and it is an, uh, unfortunate. There's, there's such, there, there's a huge impact that wolves have a negative impact on, uh, and that, that, that will, that will feed into, you know, the landscape, our wildlife, the, uh, the economy, all these things, ranching, uh, the, the revenue that ranchers can, can provide for themselves and the community, all these things that, that these wolves come in and wolves just devalue everything. Yep. And, and that's, you know, a conversation I had last week with Dr. Geist. My biggest concern is these wolves are coming in, they're annihilating our wildlife. And what is that, what is that going to do to our public lands? Because guys like me, I, you know, I don't have a ranch to hunt on like you do. You know, we depend on, on our, our public lands. What is that going to do to the public land? The, the wolves are going to annihilate the wildlife, which is going to devalue the public land system. And then it is a lot more tempting to privatize those public lands. We're not going to have anything left if we allow these wolves to run rampant. So going back to your point, uh, Colorado, you guys, 
I, I am pretty sure that that is on the ballot this fall for you, uh, whether or not. I, and, and we already know that there's one wolf pack up in the northwest corner there. Um, you, you've got to vote no on that. You've got to vote no. It is it's, it's, the, the facts it's just like do not I, align. Well, it's just like coyotes too, right? Like you could go out and shoot a coyote every single time you see one. They're still going to be there. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it's, it's the same way with wolves anymore. Like, like even if you did go out and every time you see one and they're a hell of a lot smarter than coyotes, you don't see them hardly ever. Right. Like I get them on my game cameras every once in a while you may run into one, but you don't, don't they're, they're so stinking smart. And so they don't have any type of natural predator. Right. And so they just continue multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. And, and now like you see these different figures on how many there are. And I don't even think they have a clue how many there really are. No, because it's, it's they, north of 1,500 from their last count. And I'm, I'm sure that the, it's, it's impossible to have that nailed down to a uh, very accurate number right yeah. but but they're prolific breeders and yeah. so it, it, when when we talk about like your government trappers or or trappers uh j- just idaho trappers and as specifically you know folks that are involved with like foundation for wildlife management and idaho trappers association um it is they have been doing this for a decade and have yet to capture or kill as many wolves that are born on a yearly basis Yep. And that year go that that number goes up every year because the the population rises, hence more wolves are born, and so those. The, anyway, again, we're going we're going down. Also. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is what I happens on my anti wolf stuff, man. Sorry, <laughs> I, <you know. laughs> no, I get I get on a tangent. But I'm pretty passionate about it, man. I I am yeah. uh, not super thrilled about uh, the wolf situation, and and I want to do what I can. So if if you if you need anybody to trap wolves on your property, you just let me know. I am not a trapper, but I know somebody down in your neck of the woods that would eliminate wolves on your, on your property greatly. So yeah. anyways, yeah. So I, I want to get back to the mule deer hunt. What I, I want to talk when we're off air, what, what it would cost me to come down and get a mule deer off your property next year, because I, uh, I, I, I need a mule deer. It's time. <laughs> cool. Cool. Yeah. Uh, all I, I get are like, see, three honestly, points. we, we've been, we've been, uh, sold out. So it'll depend on if, if we can, but we'll, we'll figure something out. I just want to try it. I, I want to try hunting yep. on private land one time, like where yeah. it's, you know, yeah, it's, you got the whole base into yourself kind of thing. Uh, that'd be kind of fun. Lots, lots, of, pe- lots of people do it. They're just not supposed to. <laughs> on yeah, ours yeah. at least. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Get some trespassers uh, to it, you? It's, it's part of it. It's part of yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So let's talk about cross o meats, man. I, I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, th- it's, it's a unique business. So you blow up your entire lifestyle, you and your wife, and you move to the ranch. And sell the house. Uh, you said it was down kind of in Boise, right? Yeah, outside of Boise and Emmett. And now you're in the uh, the Riggins area with this ranch. And I know it's kind of a taboo question, but about how many acres is your ranch? Uh, so we have private is uh, close to 2,800 acres. And then through like state, uh, BLM, and forest, we have about another 20,000 that we lease to run wow. cows on. That's yep. awesome. Yeah. Sweet. But I mean, for those people who maybe don't know the landscape here, uh, it's not flat and a lot of it's yeah, not grazable. So yeah, that's a lot of, I was going to say a lot of the, a lot of that acreage is not usable as a cattle rancher. <laughs> it's straight up and down Rocky, you know, it's, it's yeah. pretty brutal country. So it may yeah. sound like a ton as far as like what we graze on, but really it's <clears throat> like I said, I mean, it's a lot of up and down here. Gotcha. Gotcha. So the idea of cross meats, let me switch over to the Crosso Meat website here. The yeah. idea of Crosso Meats, uh, for, where, where'd the name come from, first of all? So our ranch is Crosso Ranch. And so we wanted to kind of kind of stick to the heritage of that. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So Crosso Ranch. And where, like, tell us a little bit about Crosso Meats and and what what the, uh, the not, I, I keep wanting to call it a platform, uh, the, yeah. what the business idea behind Crosso Meats is and kind of kind of the principles of that company. Yeah. So it kind of comes back, honestly, to some of the stuff we were talking about with, with the podcast, right? Is that, so I remember, you know, and, and for those uh, who listen, who are in the ranching industry, you probably realize that you really don't have a whole lot of control on anything, right? Prices are set by the market, you know, good years are good, bad years are bad. And usually it's like, well, just wasn't our year this year, right? And so 
rather than sitting there and kind of just accepting that, it was like, okay, let's do something else. And, and honestly, part of it is, is, is personal to me because I'll never forget. Um, so I'd always come and help my dad when we'd ship calves off in the fall. And the last year that he was alive, so he died on December 15th, uh, four, four years ago, 2016. And oh. that, that November was, was when we shipped him out was a bad year. And I remember uh, he, him and my, my stepmom and myself are down where the, where the scales are here. And I remember, you know, he just got handed a check for basically nothing, right? Because we shipped them all out and got handed a check for basically nothing. And I remember my stepmom sitting there being like, Dave, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I remember like him just saying, I don't know. Because like, I don't think people understand that when you're in an industry to where your market is essentially set for you, yes, you can get a little more, a little less, but basically it's set for you. You really don't have any control. Like my dad, every year, the cattle buyer, Ernie is his name. He would show up and man, them some damn nice looking cows, Dave. Right. But mm-hmm. it didn't matter. It didn't matter. You'd get maybe top of the market value, but it, there was still a ceiling on it no matter what. And so it didn't matter how great my dad did with his calves. And they were, in my opinion, the best in the area. Not, I mean, anywhere around here. Right. And, but it didn't matter. And so like, I'll never remember. And I, I know like, cause my dad, like three weeks later had a massive heart attack and died. Right. And I know a lot of that stress that caused that, I think came back to what he got that year. Right. Like he was getting older, he's getting more tired. You know, he's 64 years old. So he wasn't that old, but he was definitely getting older. And like, I'll never, I'll never forget like him just sitting there like I can literally, as I'm talking now, it kind of almost honestly gets me a little bit emotional about it because I just remember him sitting there being like, I don't know what to do. And so when we decided to come back to the ranch, it's like, we can't, we can't do that same model, right? Like we can't be beholden to these huge meat packing conglomerates and monopolies and everything else. Like we have to do it different. Model so was, was the like, word I was looking for, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Model. Yeah. We have to, we have to do it different. And so we're like, you know what, what if we say screw all those guys, right? Like, what if we say screw the freaking meat packing plants, the, the corporate feedlots, the, I, I mean, Jim, if you go through like kind of where, if you go to the store and you get your meat, the process that it, that it goes through, it usually starts at a ranch like ours. And then it usually goes into some cattle buyer who then usually takes it to a corporate feedlot, right? Then they usually finish them there. And then it goes, you know, to some processing plant. And then it goes like, I mean, there's literally for those people who want to check out our, our website, we kind of laid it all out, but there's like nine or 10 steps that it goes through. See, and, and that, so, that, that, that ties into a lot of what we talk about on this show where, you, you know, the re, one of the big reasons we hunt is we know where that meat comes from. Right. Yeah. And it, yep. that's important. That's important yep. because we have no idea what happens with all that. Anyway, I didn't mean to well, and people that. think that they're getting, USA beef when a lot of times they're not, they changed the rules in Congress like four years ago to where they can basically, and you can do the research. I forget the the law that was passed, but basically they can put a made in the U S sticker on beef that comes from like Australia and Uruguay. And I think even Brazil, like I can't remember it, but basically it's a bunch of backdoor deals with lobbyists and everything else, right? Like all the stuff we all love. Um, that now basically you could be buying Australian beef, uh, thinking that it's USA beef. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we were like, you know what, if someone buys meat from us, they'll know it was, it was here on our ranch. We cared for it. My kids were out there helping me feed it. Right. Like my wife was out there doing it. And so we're like, let's do it that way. And we'll we'll be as fair as we can. Obviously for us, we don't have the margins that some of these corporate feedlots have. Plus we don't cut corners. You know, they're, they're raised on grass here belly high grass all summer at about 8,000 feet, you know, mountain springs, everything else. They come in, we finish them with like non-GMO barley because I think grass-fed beef is awful. Uh, It doesn't have any flavor half the time. It's stringy, Um, Mm -hmm. just my opinion. So we do, we finish them off with, with naturally grown locally raised barley to give them that, that marbling and, and you know, the flavor. And so, yeah, it goes basically from us. We, we process at USDA. So we take it to the facility ourselves and then we ship it out to you ourselves. So it's literally us in every part of this process. And so that way we know if someone buys meat from us, they, they don't have to guess if it came from Australia or if it came from the U.S. They know that it wasn't pumped full of, of maybe a bunch of corn and, and all this other, you know, steroids and everything else. Um, they know it came from our ranch. Like we raised it naturally, ethically, and then we had our hand in the entire process. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, 
it's actually been awesome so far. Um, that's, that's fantastic. You know, trying to stay outside of the box with it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, cause I'm, I'm on the website, you can get, you can get the practical pack, uh, which that, and you've got like a picture of a, a just a normal fridge freezer combo thing. So that would fit in that yep. is what you're saying. Yep. Um, yep. Oh, let me go back here. And then the, the planner pack with the, the chest freezer and the yep. prepper pack is like two chest freezers. Yep. So basically it's, it's kind of, it's, it's pretty much basically an eighth, <laughs> a quarter or a half. Um, one of the things when we first started is like, okay, we'll probably end up selling a lot of these quarter and these halves, right? Like people stocking up. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is, is that we've actually had more orders of the eighth than anything else. And I, you know, I mean, again, we live very rural, so we have two huge chest freezers, right? I mean, you just, yeah, think a lot of people do that live rural, uh, but a lot of people who live in cities or, or, you know, apartments, stuff like that, they, they have no place for a chest freezer. And so an eighth is where, what they kind of have to, if they want to buy it quote unquote in bulk. So yeah, it's been kind of fascinating to see it, but, but yeah, we try to do the different options and actually we're. We're going to be rolling out more of kind of like some of the different boxes and stuff like that models to where if you maybe you don't want a whole eighth, but you want, you know, some burgers and some steaks or something like that, um, we'll do, we'll do those as well. And so for a guy like me, that's up in, you know, I'm just North out of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, I can, I can buy this, the, the practical pack or whatever, and, and I can meet you in like Lewiston to pick it up kind of thing. Yep. Yep. So basically we'll, we'll, we'll meet anybody um, pretty much from Boise to Lewiston all along there. Um, I, I mean, if it's not too much further out of that, we're, we're reasonable, right? Uh, sure. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of how we have it set up. So we've got, we ship out a fair amount. Um, you know, since we do it all USDA, we can ship out to, to any of the states. Um, but yeah, we've actually had more orders than what I thought, honestly, uh, have been relatively local. And so, yeah, we'll meet people in Boise all the way up to Lewiston. Okay. I think, I think we're going to have a rendezvous in Boise or not Boise, uh, Lewiston when, when this next round comes out. Nice. Uh, yeah. Cause we, we like, we like having stocked freezers, whether, and, and we like the combination. Uh, we're not holistically just on game meat because I'm not good enough. Uh, I'm not a good enough hunter to, to <laughs> live <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah. But, yeah. um, so you, you gotta have uh, a ribeye too, right? Like, yeah, God, I like a good ribeye. In that. <laughs> yeah. Man, I found that I, 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 I got a tri-tip, like I got that dialed in on my charcoal grill too. So the, that's pretty good. And, um, you know, so it's, it's just good. It's good to have the variety too, because, yeah. uh, and that's a mistake. A lot of people think, uh, or, or make, I, I think a lot of people, you know, they're, they're, they're like, Oh, well, game meat is so gamey. Deer meat is so dear, you know, gamey and blah, blah, blah. And they, the problem is, is they try to treat it too much like beef. Uh, yep. you need to cook a mule deer, like a mule deer, not, not like beef and don't, don't treat yep. it like beef because it is different. And so, um, at some point I'm going to have a podcast just on that topic, but, uh, that, that's one thing that, that, that people need to know is, is, is now that, that is with the exception of a good whitetail, uh, whitetail, I feel like you can just pretty much treat like beef and, and, uh, yeah. you know, good, a good whitetail, it doesn't take much to make it. Amazing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You could, uh, lots you could do with that. So this is, this is really cool. So you started this and how's it been going so far since the startup? It's been going really well. Um, we're, we're pretty new to it still. Um, I, I mean, really we launched it, what? I think in April, March. Yeah, I want to say it was like this last spring is when I, I knew. Yeah. It. Yeah. We started doing pre-selling then. And then, um, I mean, we haven't, we haven't done any advertising. I mean, it's been a couple Facebook posts. So, um, next year yeah. we're really wanting to, to try to scale this up. And so we'll probably start doing some more marketing and stuff at that point. But, you know, we wanted to, we wanted to make sure there was a demand for it. I thought there would be, but, it was actually pretty, pretty overwhelming the demand. And so, so yeah, now next year we'll, we'll keep a lot more of the calves here. Uh, you know, our steers here, uh, when they come in this fall mm -hmm. and be able to ramp it up next year and hopefully just keep growing. You know, there's, there's so many good people that, you know, we have some owners in the cattle business. Uh, it was one of the things we had to do when we bought out our stepmom because we couldn't afford to, to buy out her portion of the ranch and go and cause she had sold all of my dad's cows. Uh, or most of them, um, we couldn't go and just, you know, drop another couple hundred thousand dollars on, on restarting our herd. And so we have some partners and it's like, you know, like they go through the same stuff that we go through that my dad went through with the, the cattle prices. Right. And it's like, okay, like we can, we can literally impact a bunch of families if, if this thing works, right? Mm -hmm. Like if we can get this thing working and up to the level that, that I believe it can get, 
like we can we can impact you know the the local guy who's giving us the bar you know who's selling us the barley like the you know eventually like like i'll just say it now because like we have these grandiose plans like one day we want to have like our own usda facility here in riggins and then guess what that provides jobs there's no jobs in our town right that's yeah, why yeah. The, the school has shrunk it's about half the size as it was when i was there close to 20 years ago and so it's like you know, like I want to, I want to build this. Obviously, yes, we want to do well. I'm not going to sugarcoat that, but more importantly than that, but, like, and I you want, don't need to be apologetic about that either. Yeah. You yeah. Know, it's, but it, it's it, like it, on top of that, like I want, you know, I want our, I want to be able to put a, a facility here and, you know, hire more people and bring more kids in the school. Like my, my daughter's class has like seven kids in it. Right. Like, I mean, I don't ever want her to have a boyfriend, but if she does want one, I at least want her to have some options, you know what I mean? And like <laughs> get some more kids in the school. So, uh, you know, it, it, I, I just want, I, I'm hoping that it goes in a direction to where we can, you know, we can make it bigger than, than again, just kind of us and us being fed and, and, you know, making some money. What I, what I really like about it, Derek, is that, that is the essence of what, what it is to be an American. You had the freedom, you, you had the choice, you had the option. You, you traded in your lifestyle for a lifestyle that was going to be harder with a lot more adversity. And you, you, you've got creative with how you were going to determine your future and your destiny. You, you didn't let, you know, guys like us, we don't, we don't allow, we, we don't want the government to determine our destiny, right? And, and you're an outdoorsman, you're a hunter, you're a rancher, you're a family man, you're a podcaster like me. That, so we're peeps, right? <laughs> yeah. <yep. laughs> so so I sure. love that. I love that part. But it, it's, what's cool about it is you're like, screw the way that they've been doing it for years that keeps the rancher down. I'm going to do it my own way with this direct-to-consumer business model. And it's, it exploded. I, I know because I was, I jumped on your website to make an order and it told me that it, you guys were you, sold out. So yeah. I couldn't. And, and that actually, I was disappointed I couldn't make the order. Uh, cause I, we've been buying some beef from a, a local farm here, but it's, it's, uh, I, it changed ownership and, and things got a little weird. Mm. So anyway, yep. um, yep. We got, we got pre-sale available now. If, Shameless plug. Sorry, I guess. But no, we're we, I mean, if people do want to want to pre-order it. They could they could hop on there, and and uh, our next round will be out here in like two months, well, about a month and a half, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I'd I'd encourage people. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put the website uh, to both the podcast and Crossroad Meets in in the show notes here, so people can jump on there and check it out. But that's awesome. that's what I really like is is you took this idea, you created a a model that is outside the, the norm. But I, I do feel like a lot of ranches are going to start going this way. It feels like it's, it's like kind of a new trend in it, so to yep. speak. Uh, it keeps that, that food chain, I, I guess is one way to put it a lot more specific and local, um, more control. You're not, this is not like a factory farm, you know? Yep. And, and so it's the, the, the quality of the meat is better. And, and you took that as, as a, from a dream to a reality. And that is what is the essence of, of being an American and carving out and scratching out your own way of life and living and destiny and all these things that, that, that get me. I get excited over this stuff. I, I, I geek out on this kind of stuff. So <laughs> I really like talking about it. And um, that's freaking awesome, man. Just so like, Thank just you. congratulations. I, I really you. like it. Is there anything yeah. else you want people to know about Crossroad Meats? You know, uh I would say check out the website. Like we, we, you know, we try to be uh, just transparent about it. You know what I mean? It's like if they come here and and they, you know, some of these cattle buyers give you, you know, a dollar thirty a pound or something like that, and then it shows up on your, you know, on the meat counter for, you know, seventeen dollars a pound for a ribeye or something else. It's like, man, there's a lot of people that are making money along that process that that aren't the ranchers, right? Yeah. Because eventually you know, like it would be great to, to even co-op with some of the other ranchers around here. You know, I know some, just some amazing people, you know, one of our neighbors down the road here, he's an older guy, you know, he's battled cancer. He's just holding on, right? Like he comes up and he uses our weight scale sometimes. And, you know, he's just holding on by a thread. And, you know, two years ago, he's telling his wife one more year like that and we're out of business. And, you know, and these are people that work hard and they're good, just, they're just good people, but they mm -hmm. just have no control over what, what's going on in the market. And it's like, you know, if, if we could help those people out, right. People like my dad, like if my dad was still alive, like if this business would help someone out like my dad to be able to make, I don't know, maybe he makes a little more because all the money isn't lost in the middlemen, right. And in the packing plants and all the, you know, the garbage that goes on in between, like, 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, exactly. it's, it's, I don't know. I, I mean, I hope it's like a noble thing, right? Like obviously we want people to have them awesome meat, but even like further and deeper than that, you know, having just helping people right at, at this grassroots rancher level, I think is always going to be a good thing. Like we can help those people. We can have those families because I, I mean, Jim, you've probably seen it in North Idaho too, but people aren't ranching anymore. There's no money in it. Right. Like, just like me. Yeah. Right. Like I grew up and it was like, I could stay on the ranch and my dad's income goes from 20 grand a year to whatever. I mean, what's he going to pay me? Right. What, what, what yeah, would I make if I would have stayed on the ranch? It's, it's I, not I even, it's not feasible. It's not feasible. Yeah. Like my, the, the ranch I was talking about in my family, the, the, the only reason it makes money anymore is because they lease out a huge section of it to a pheasant, uh, hunting club yeah. basically, you yeah. know? And, and so no, it's, it's, it's the so way what it, happens when, what happens then when all these ranches go away because people can't afford to do them? You know, they can't afford to run them. Yeah. Then all of our meat is as centralized as what like our government it is, right? Like, like literally you'll have these massive feedlots to where it's all right here. And I, I'm, I'm like a big advocate, whether it's in business, whether it's in government, whatever, like I don't like centralized power. I don't think that ever is good. It's just, you know, there's just too many things that can be corrupted when too much power is in a central location. Yeah. And so I, I, I would agree. rather a bunch of people like us go direct to consumer, like let people make the decisions as to where they're going to get it. Because if these family farms and these family ranches keep going out of business the way they have been, I mean, there's a stat, it's like 60, I, I hate stats because I always screw them up, but I remember it was like 60 something <laughs> percent of like family owned ranches have gone out of business in like the last 60 years. And it's like, if that trend continues, like where are we going to eat from? Right. I, know, I mean, are we and, all going to be eating this beyond beef stuff or tofu burgers or you know uh, no, I mean? right. Like, like that, that's, that's the, uh, that's a super frustrating aspect of it because what, what happens to these ranches is they turn into like these recreational, uh, resorts or they turn into a track home, uh, subdivision or they, yep. you know, or they just, you know, you know, nothing happens on the land and the, and the land isn't used and, and that's inappropriate. And so that's, the, your, the the point to what you're making. This is what happens when when there is like a, this overbearing centralized power or or whatever. And and this is why you know here in Idaho we're getting inundated with people from California moving here because yep. that that system doesn't work. And and people recognize that and they 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 want out of that. It's it's their lives are bogged down by this big power that is trying to dictate folks' life. And in Idaho we don't want that. And in a lot of our Western states, that's, that's not what we want. And it's ruining a lot of the, the way of life that, that we know because it's a lot more tempting to take a 2,800 acre ranch and sell it to some, you know, developer out of California yeah. or something than well, make we've had 30, so many 40 offers. grand. Oh, I'll bet you have. Yeah. We have. I mean, our neighbor to the, to the south of us happens to be like the heir of Albertsons, right? Yeah, and yeah. he's wanted to buy it over and over and over and over and over. And, you know, some days it is tempting because it's like, you know, you just take a bunch of money and go relax. Maybe. I don't know. I don't even yeah. know what he'd pay for it. But, but then it's like, is that really what we want? You know, like, no, like we, well, we kind of goes, in, embrace the suck, right? Like that's, it goes back to the legacy thing you were talking yeah. about. You know, is that, is that the kind of legacy I want? Uh, yep. I, I wouldn't want that legacy. And so I'm, I'm proud of you for sticking that out and, and doing the hard thing. And because I, I think that uh, companies like Crosso Meats, this is important stuff. This, this isn't just a, this is like a community type kind of company. Like you said, you, you want to have, you want to provide jobs. Uh, people like me want to buy uh, our beef from places like Crosso Meats. I don't want some Brazilian grown cow that, that I bought in, in, at, at, down at the, the Albertsons or whatever in my freezer. And that's, that's a big reason why I hunt. That's, I, yeah. I, like, I like to know where that meat comes from. And, yeah. you know, I like, uh, I like the shirts you have for sale, the still vegan. Where, where was still that? Not still, still not vegan. Still not vegan. Oh, still not. Yeah. Hashtag still not vegan with the flag on it. Well, it was, <laughs> it was funny too. It's, it's one of those stupid things that happened. So like on Instagram one day, because that that uh, documentary uh, was it Game Changers or something came out about how all these athletes are going vegan and they're just the best thing in the world. Yeah, uh, I, I I watched it. You know, I, again, like I try to see everything. I I poke fun at vegans, but I do try to you know keep an open mind to everything. And so I was doing an Instagram story one time. I was sitting there frying a big old huge pan of bacon, and I was like, you know, after watching that Game Changers show, 
I decided to go vegan and then I flipped the camera around and it showed all the bacon. I was like, just kidding. Still not vegan. Well then like a couple people messaged me and they're like, you need to make a shirt like that. And it's like, okay, cool. And we did. And we've actually like sold a lot of, I, it, again, it's kind of a silly thing, but <laughs> yeah. I love wearing them in places like McCall, you know, cause everybody yeah, yeah. glares at you. So, yeah. Lots of, uh, lots of vegans down there. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's what, it's, we get that. Great. We have that touristy aspect up here in Coeur d'Alene. So if you go downtown, uh, I'm, I'm yeah. going to probably have to get me one of those shirts, man. Um, <laughs> uh, they're, they're awesome. Well, the funny thing is, is you'll get some people like, yeah, man. And other people like glaring at you like yeah, <laughs> carnivore, you know, <laughs> I think there is uh there, the, the vegan lifestyle is, is really taking a hit lately because uh, there's a lot more evidence coming out of the, the negative impacts health wise yeah. of, of being that way. But, and I don't understand it obviously, but you know, and I, I'm not one of those guys that wants to tell somebody else how to live their life. If they want to be vegan, whatever, but uh, you know, don't, don't, don't try to shove that down my throat because it ain't going to well, happen. And stop making it <laughs> political, right? Like that's yeah, the thing yeah. uh, again, like, Oh, you're killing the environment with your, your meat eating and blah, like there, there's just certain things where sometimes it's like, come on. There's no, you know, there's no, is, yeah, there's no evidence that actually supports that theory. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's such an inappropriate theory. And that, that, that is what is killing a lot of things in America, man. And, and not to get in, into a, some other rant about it, but this, this emotionally based environmentalism is, is making a huge problem for everything from traditional American values to the economy. It's, it's not feasible stuff that is not based in facts. This is, this is, we cannot allow emotional philosophy to dictate factual lifestyles. And, and that's, yep. that's, that's something that I, I've been trying to talk about a little bit more, but, but yeah, it's, it's anyway, there's a lot of information coming out this showing, you know, uh, if you want to be a vegan, I, I have no problem with that. But for me, I, I like, I like the energy. I like the real protein. I, I like my brain functioning appropriately and my skin color being normal. Uh, yeah. Not not skin color in terms of, you know, race. I, I mean, I, I'm not like pale, <laughs> you yeah. know, so. Yeah, exactly. Like there's actual health. pigment. Yeah. 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 There's actual pigmentation in my skin and, <laughs> yeah. and like I, I look like a normal human being. So um, yeah. anyways, dude, this has been a fun conversation. Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed it. A lot of fun. We need to, we need to like keep just kind of a running, uh, a check in with each other all the time. Yeah, for sure. No, I'd love that. I mean, Hey man, we're, we're in Idaho together, right? Uh, that's right. That's I, I right. Kind of consider Riggins probably to be more of like North Idaho than, than, you know, Southern Idaho. So, so yeah, yeah we, we, we yeah, speak for the sure. same language for sure. Yeah. You were, I was just down in uh, kind of your neck of the woods. I, well, I was just North you up in Greensville for a work yeah. thing the other day. So, um, yeah. yeah, we're, we're not very far from each other. Yeah, if you make it down this way, you have to let me know. Yeah, will we stay in that? There's that. There's a hotel on like the. I think it's like the south end of town. The house balconies over overlooking the river. Yeah, the Best Western there. Is that is that what it is? Yep. Yeah, yep. we've I've stayed there many a time. So uh, it's a it's a good spot. So yeah, good times, man. Yeah, well, I I appreciate you coming on the show. Where can yeah. people find both your podcast and uh, obviously Crosso Meets? Uh, I've got you at primalking.com and yep. cro is it just crosso meats.com? Yep. Yep. It's crosso meats and meats is plural, uh, .com. And then, yeah, I guess if for people on social media, uh, Instagram, I'm probably the most active, I guess if, if you're on there, it's just at primal.king. So, uh, yeah, try to try to try to put some views out there. Sometimes I get myself in a little bit of trouble, but, uh, Hey, oh. I'm going to say what I think. And, and so we yeah, all do that sort of thing. I guess you can follow me along there. <laughs> wait, wait, let, let me, let me find that. It was, I, I think I'm following you on, on Instagram, but at primal primal dot King. Oh no, I am. Okay. Yeah. We're yeah. good. Cool. Cool. I'll, I'll put that in the show notes too. Throw your Instagram okay. in. There. Yeah. I think awesome. that's, that's cool. Well, Derek, I appreciate this. This is this has been awesome, and and uh, like I said, let's let's uh, do this again and, and just stay in touch. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how this thing unfolds with Crosso Meats, and and uh, always looking forward to your episodes coming out on Primal King Podcast. Uh, you've had some great guests on there, and uh, that's uh, it's it's just been fun watching this thing unfold and and and, and grow, man. That's that's what it's yeah. all about. So. Uh, let's keep in touch. I'm, I'm definitely going to buy some meat from you. So we're going to have to meet Sweet. up in, in Lewiston. I actually, I don't care. I'll drive all the way down to your place and pick it up. So it'd be kind of a fun little family <laughs> outing actually. Yeah. Yeah. Either way. Yeah. Let me know. Uh, you know, if, uh, 
depending on the time of the year, maybe we can buzz up and check out the mountains a little bit. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yep. We'll, uh, yeah, maybe we can well, do a little wolf hunting. Yeah. Heck yeah. I'd love to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a, uh, I have a new wolf call I'm going to be trying out. So, uh, that might be something to see. I've I, yes. I have not been successful with a wolf just so you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Depending on who listens either. Of, no, I'm just kidding. I, I haven't either. No. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. I appreciate it. Uh, All right. Thanks. Stay thanks, on the line here after we hang up okay. and, uh, we'll, we'll get this sorted out. Cool. Thanks a bunch. You made it all the way to the end. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. We sure appreciate your support. This is Jim Huntsman signing off and reminding you to check us out at Instagram at The Western Huntsman and on Facebook at The Western Huntsman. And you can also check out the website at thewesternhuntsman.com. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you on the mountain.